Hi everybody, Jed Ayers here, and welcome to another episode of The Attic. And visiting us today in The Attic is a very special guest and a great friend and mentor to me, a major entrepreneur and executive in the end user computing space. He was the president and CEO of Weiss, the cloud computing software company, when it was acquired by Dell. Then he was the chairman and CEO at Nixenta, a global leader in AI and multi-cloud data management. And after that, Chief Commercial Officer at Nutanix. He's an investor via one of the leading open source community venture funds. He's on numerous boards, a frequent speaker and commentator on current business and tech issues. With us today in the attic, my good friend, Tarkin Maynard. Tarkin, welcome to the attic. It is wonderful to see you. You're looking beautiful as always. Thank you so much for being here. This is the first attic we've actually been able to film in person post COVID. So uh, let's say- uh, Thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah, Good thank to see you. Thank you so much Good for being you. here. Long time no see. Yeah, yeah Good exactly. To see you. So uh, yeah, we want to talk to you about tech and all the amazing stuff that you're doing in tech. But because this is the attic, we love to talk to people about their origin story and how you got into tech and kind of what shaped you from a great leader that you are and some of the values you have. So. I know a lot of people uh, in our audience know about you, uh, you know, and all the great things you've done in, in tech, but maybe they don't know as much about your childhood. So why, why don't we start there? Where, where did you grow up? And tell us a little bit about your childhood. Sure, sure. Thank you. First of all, great to see you. Thank great you. day in San Francisco. And finally, post-COVID, and we're all together in person. Love it. So um, look, um, I'm Turkish, as you know. Uh, very Turkish name, Tarkan. Um, been in the US almost for 30 years, but I started my you know, college education around industrial engineering, engineering management. My first job ever out of college was uh, in Germany, uh, designing, you know, cars and cockpit systems for Daimler Benz. You know, spent some time with them um, and, and I just wanted to get into business. Came to US, get my MBA, and then ended up with a company called Sterling Software. Uh, it was a software company out of Texas. And from that on, we IPO the division and then just off you go. From so company to company, so jumping let's around. Go, let's go back to the very yeah. beginning again. So tell me a little bit about your uh, childhood, your parents, your mom and your dad. So look, uh, mom and dad, Turkish, Istanbul, uh, growing up in Istanbul, born in Ankara. And, you know, uh, my dad was a big electrical engineer, uh, did his education in Germany. And um, I went to a German high school. Wow, uh, so lots of roots in Germany. Yeah, because of the my dad's uh, roots, my mom also... Uh, they got married there. They lived there for a while. So, um, so you my speak any German? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Zika. Um, that's why I know um, Eigel pretty well. And we don't call it Eigel. We call it Eagle. Eagle. Actually, actually, I've been with, uh, uh, with Eagle Heiko. team, Eagle team, Eigel yes. team in, in Bremen, in Frankfurt uh, many, many times. Because, as you know, Germany was also a big country for VDI and desktop virtualization. So a lot of these, you know, financial services companies and so on got into VDI before anybody else did for security and control reasons. So spent a lot of time in Germany. So what kind of a kid were you? Were you into sports or? Uh, sports, a lot of soccer, a lot of basketball. I played, you know, college, college basketball, high school basketball, a little bit of soccer, football. We call it Fußball in German. Right. Um, um, and still continue, still play basketball and football. As you can see, uh, I had gained a little bit of weight. I used to play striker. Now I'm playing like a little bit more defense, but you know, life goes on. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So you, uh, like many of the guests that are on our show, we like to do a little uh, research on you. And we found that you, when you were 15, you had your first company. So a lot of the people we've interviewed, they were early entrepreneurs. So tell us a little bit about what you ha did when you were 15. Oh, put in those wounds. Oh, man, 15. <laughs> so look, three friends from high school. We um, this, Look, I'm 53. We're talking about this is almost 40 years ago. Um, it, you know, there's no internet, there's no, uh, so to speak, online life. And, and I used to travel quite a bit with my family. And in every city you go to in Europe, you know, in a hotel, there would be a map of the city. So you can go places. And usually these maps were done by the hotel chains and so forth. And, you right, know, when you check in, they would Exactly, they give you a map or... because there's no online, there's no phone, there's no iPhone, nothing, right? So in Istanbul, where I'm from, huge city, 20 million people, there's no map. Because Istanbul is such an old city, if you want to create a map, it will be like you know, you know, difficult to do it. So we decided to create that map. Uh, we basically, with three kids from you know some college book, we photocopied the map and printed out in color version, and we went to a bunch of restaurants, 
and have them pay for this map printing and put their logos on those streets on the map and started giving these maps to hotels. So, um, and we charge the hotels for the map and we charge the restaurants. So you get uh, them on both sides. Exactly, so that was our first business and there were no Uber, we didn't drive, we didn't have licenses. So we traveled, walked around the city like four, four or five months, I lost tons of weight. <laughs> and, and, and you know, you just changed maybe 10 shoes, 10 pairs of shoes. And that was our first business, and it was a very profitable business. And we were the, still the first map of Istanbul for uh, touristic reasons. Uh, and you still have one of these maps? Yeah, at home. I'll bring you one. You're I gonna, want you're one gonna of crack these. up. That was the first offline map of Google Maps, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. You, you were like before Yelp, before, before Google Yelp. Maps. Exactly. Exactly. That's great. So I didn't realize this, but you went to Harvard. Correct. So you you, you left uh, Istanbul and. Got to the, is that was your first uh, time in the U.S.? Or? So um, I went to a, a, a German high school in, in, in Turkey. My, a, I speak obviously Turkish, and the language I learned was German and French. I never spoke English. Um, so uh, when I came uh, uh, to um, U.S., I had all the industrial engineering degree. I came for my MBA. So I got my master's in a small school in Texas. Uh, in Wichita Falls, Texas, which is famous for its, for its big NATO Air Force Base. Okay. Where there are a lot of you know German, Turkish, Spanish pilots and so forth, where all the NATO pilots are trained on F-16 uh, jets at that time. So I spent a lot of time there I, you know, to make money, to go to school and so on, pay tuition. I used to babysit German kids and French kids and you know, Turkish kids of all these generals and so So you were an au pair. Exactly, I was an au pair. I'm sure that no one <laughs> in the audience knew that Tarkin Maynard was I was the best au pair you could get. And my, my kids agree currently. My, I have a six and two year old. Um, so I got a lot of training. My wife loves that. Uh, but to give you an example, I didn't speak English when I came to US. It was very difficult for me first. Um, so when I got college here, I spent the first six months in English courses. So it was a, it was a journey for me. Uh, so that's how I got into you know, the uh, school there, got my master's, and then years later, in 2000s, early 2000s, I got the AMP, a post-MBA degree, which is a advanced management program at, 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 at Harvard. Yeah. Okay. So Tarkin, most everyone in our audience knows you from your time at Weiss, right? So right. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you ended up at Weiss and yeah. uh, you know, the, the journey at Weiss, because it's this fascinating story. Sure, sure. I was actually with uh, Computer Associates. I was, um, a kind of chief of staff to uh, uh, Charles Wang, the founder. Um, at that time, the CEO, Sanjay Kumar. Uh, basically, I used to run the business development, partial corp dev, uh, you know, did a few acquisitions and divestitures, uh, did the product management, product marketing, all the, you know, uh, global accounts and things of that nature. I was doing multiple roles for Charles and Sanjay. Um, around that time, young, you know, um, a lot of energy running around the world. You had a lot of energy. Yeah, I know, I know, a lot of <laughs> coffee, a lot of Turkish coffee. So Charles and Sanjay, we used to travel the world and, you know, they were, I learned a lot from them, obviously, uh, a global presence, you know, this was a $6 billion company, a lot of work going on in Asia. And through those connections, uh, I, I met uh, the original founders of Weiss. Weiss stood for Wu Yi Se. Three owners, three founders, and Bernie says wife. That's why the logo was wise with four ticks. Wait, so four was, original it, founders. Okay, so it's four founders. Four Chinese founders, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and, and, and Taipei based. I spent time, Charles was friends with them. Through a few connections, uh, uh, got to know them. At that time, wise was actually a, a going through a rough time. It was a bankruptcy situation. So uh, basically, we decided to help the original founders to take the company, pri privatize the company, take it over, and basically rebuilt the business. So it was right. basically a bankruptcy restructuring situation. And the investors were worried because WISE was a big brand in Asia with a lot of political support, a lot of big VIPs as investors and owners. They want to make sure that that turnaround is successful. And WISE was a big brand in the last 30 years. So it was a complete turnaround situation. That's how it came about. And so how, how did what gave you the confidence that you thought you could turn this thing around? I'll tell Originally, you. Originally, you were the CMO, though, right? Yeah. So, so, started there. yeah, so the investors, at that time, there was a CEO. The company was in dire straits, uh, you know, very little revenue in, in $20 million plus um, and burning tons of cash. It was a, a, a difficult situation. This was a multi-million dollar company, by the way, before. Uh, so, but we saw as investor group a huge opportunity. Uh, there were U.S. investors, there are in, in, investors from Asia. Uh, our Taiwanese investors were uh, kind of, you know, 
were turned off about the results and where the market is going on with PCs. As you know, mobile phones coming up, you know, in 2006, iPhone is coming out. So um, the goal was, hey, look, security is going to be a big deal. Let's create something really unique and let's use the cloud. And nobody talked about cloud back in 2003, 2004. So we negotiated with the investors for about a couple of years, from 2003 to 2005, we closed the deal in 2005. And the basic premise was basically, look, PCs are great, but they are fat, they are a um, huge attack surface. We believed uh, thin devices, zero devices, cloud client computing was the right way to I go. I remember your yeah. uh, most famous early marketing was PC with a big line through it. No. <laughs> and you did this before uh, our guy down the street put the, uh, so uh, you know, put so software. Remember when he did this, right? He yeah. had the same co concept. So Mark was actually yeah. a great friend and yeah. he supported Wise. Actually, um, he was part of the investment group. Okay. Um, and he did a few videos for Wise, and he used to see our no PC logo all the time. So no software logo was kind of like a, a copycat, but you know, like we, we love that. We want people to copy our stuff more often. Right? I remember visiting your office uh, down in San Jose, and the whole parking lot was full of cars. I think you paid your employees. To, I was paying, to high, you know, five hundred dollars a month for employees who put those logos on their cars. And hey, you know, I'll, are you still paying? I'll put one on my Tesla. I'm still paying. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, I would love to talk to you about a category because I mean, I think that's every entrepreneur's dream is to start and do something that is a category creator. And I think, you know, what you did with the zero client, um, and we're still competing against those today, right? right. In terms of the mind share that you got in terms of right. creating uh, a zero client. So can you talk? I mean, it sounds like in sure. your narrative that sort of helped save the company. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Can absolutely. you talk a little bit about how that came about? And right. Look, our, you know, at the end of the day, um, we talked to tons of customers, partners. You know, you at that point, you were with MTM, right? You yeah. were, uh, you were one of our big partners. Actually, you and I had a conversation. I remember many, many, many years ago. We were char more charming and thinner at that time. I, right. I remember speaking about yeah, thin clients. Twenty years ago, exactly. I think, is when I first yeah. met you. Look, look. The one key thing is one misconception was, and still is to a certain extent. Oh, I'm gonna put a bunch of zero clients, cloud clients, it's gonna be cheaper. Being cheap was not, was not the differentiator. The differentiation was complete control and secure computing that you can control, manage users carefully, and you provide ultimate security with no attack surface. Yeah. So that was the key his story here. And that's why this business in regulated industries like government, state and local, education, financial services, healthcare, just boomed. And one last point, we never said think clients and VDI and desktop as a service is for everyone. It's for every organization, but for certain users, it's certain even better. Cases. So we love that coexistence with PCs, workstations, you know, from super workers to knowledge workers to task workers, there is a play for everyone. So we believed thin devices, zero clients, cloud client computing, VDI, desktop as a service was a great fit for certain type of users, certain type of user profile and application and workloads, and that worked very well for us. Look, we grew from $20 million a year to almost $600 million a year in less than almost five years. Yeah. The company grew so fast because the market was the right market, message was the right message, great partners like you at MTM and others. And you know that ecosystem, and that ecosystem is still successful with this pandemic. is going right. nuts, as you know. Yeah, well, it's about focus. I still remember, I think I met you about 20 years ago, and not long after we met, at Synergy, which obviously was the big show, I remember Mark Templeton standing up on that stage and holding a device, which of course as a software company, you know, that was uh, really the innovator in this space, to be standing on the stage at Synergy with this device he was holding in his hand and was like, this is the future to connect to, to Zen app. This yeah. is this Zen client, right? right? And I felt like that was a moment that, uh, really rocketed uh, the company forward. And Absolutely, and I know a lot of other hardware companies were going nuts, why is this device? I'll tell you, great right. things happen, as you know, Jed, look, you, you are the PhD in this. Great things happen only because of great people and great friendships and great trust. So yep. when we were designing our products, software products and hardware products, we actually would open the kimono with the partners. We would sit down with Citrix, say, look, this is our roadmap, you know, literally week by week, and this is what we're gonna uh, do in the back end, front end, and, and the protocol. And we even would sit down and ask them, how do you wanna call this brand? We would actually bring Citrix team to discussions on roadmap definition and even branding our products. Let's brand it together. Because at that time, as you know, Citrix was pushing 
Zen and Zen Desktop and Zen App. Everything was Zen. Of course, we said, okay, let's name this similarly so we can win together, right? right? You know, make it simple for the customer. Take all the friction, all the attitude out of the game. You know, just be humble, open-minded, and win together. So we would sit down with Cisco, Dell, HP. HP used to uh, compete with us with thin devices. Lenovo would compete with, you know, with us with thin devices. We would sit down and basically do branding exercises together, roadmap integration. Literally, Zen product and Vice's famous Zenith product came yeah, from Citrix. That's the name I was looking for. Correct. And that was, you know, in a well, meeting. Mark was a great marketer absolutely. too. He probably I helped said, come up with that. Absolutely. I said, Mark, what do, you want to, what do you want to call this? You know, we're going through names and let's call Zenith. Done. You know, that was a decision made together. You know, we never done things just because how we felt like it. Because we believed knowledge and truth comes from different sources. We learned a lot from our channel. We loved our channel. As you know, uh, Wise did not win any deal direct. Everything was through channel, to right. distribution, our distributors and resellers, customers. We would do focus groups all the time. And you know this, Jed, you're doing this all the time with Agile. So we learned a lot from customers, partners, and channel. And we made everything based on that feedback. So you uh, hit a note with me where it's like, you know, my parents always told me ne never do anything great by yourself, right? And it's uh, a Go team, uh, you know, whether it's your partners, or your employees, and I would say to, for you, you uh, are a great leader in the sense that you attracted a lot, lot of great people at Weiss. In fact, I think we have 40 to 50 of them that uh, you know have come to work at Agile. And so I'd love to talk to you a little bit about your sort of philosophy in terms of recruiting and retaining right. great talent, because right. I think that's obviously foundational to doing something exceptional like what you did at no. Weiss. So no, thank you. So look, it, it's always a team effort. Like whenever you see someone goes, I, 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 there's something wrong, right? Nobody right. can do this by themselves because even if you read every single document, paper, book, ever written, every tweet, you're never gonna be as smart as we think we, we will be. So um, one key thing to attract good people to become part of a journey, you need to give them the autonomy, you need to give them an environment where they can learn and excel. So Authentically, we try to create an environment. It's fun, it's success driven, and people have autonomy. They can you know, run their business. I literally treat every employee as a partner, as a CEO of their own right. That's so, exactly what we say at IGEL. We yeah. always tell people, you're the CEO of your territory. And no one wants to be micromanaged, right? Yeah, but, Nobody but, wants to be micromanaged. And you know, Jed, to a certain extent, exactly. To a certain extent, you need to give some roadmap. There's, it has to be, some, otherwise you, you're going to have chaos either. There's going right. to be some kind of a prescription. There's going to be some kind of a description on things. There's going to be some kind of a planning. But within the given you know, uh, framework, give freedom to people. Uh, most people don't leave jobs for uh, money. They leave jobs and attrition happens, especially in this uh, uh, industry where we live in the Bay Area, there's a lot of attrition. Not because of necessarily all, all money. People want to learn new things and they want to you know, create new things and they want to have a certain freedom. Of course, money is important, but these other things are equally and sometimes more important for good people. Yeah. People who excel, they like to have the freedom and we want to give them that freedom to excel. You know? Yeah, so I want to put the uh, book end on why. So you're growing the company, doing very well. I think you took number one position. You're approaching 600 million. You, got great partnerships with VMware and Citrix, and I think even Cisco, you were putting uh, devices out for their VoIP phones. Talk to me a little bit about uh, how that, how, how did you end up selling the company? I don't know how much you want to share, but I love the story you yeah, told me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just so you know, uh, I, mean, I know it's gonna sound semantics a little bit, but we never sold the company. The company was literally bought. We never put the company, we never had a banker. That was never our approach. Our goal was to IPO uh, wise at that time because growth was great. We were always super, um, you know, uh, profitable. We never raised money. We did the first investment to take the company private. From that point in 2004, 2005, when the deal closed, we never put additional dollars to the company. The company was completely uh, cash flow positive from the beginning uh, as we as we structured things. So having said all this, the key thing for us was I'll tell you, Jed, again, going back, to partnerships, trusted. Net val creating value networks with the customers, with investors, with partners, with VIPs. Look, we had the, some of the best consultants ever as a friend of the company. We never paid a dime because they were part of the journey with us. C clearly, we give them an upside at the time that we exit the business. But um, the company built such amazing partnerships with VMware, with Citrix, with Microsoft. Paul Moritz was actually at Microsoft before VMware doing deals with us. 
uh, Satya Nadella, at that time it was actually VP of OEM, selling us Windows Embedded. He would call me every quarter. We would do, you know, uh, revenue planning. Mm -hmm. uh, these are Mark at Citrix, uh, John Chambers at Cisco, Michael Dell at, uh, at Dell, Lenovo with YY, with Chairman YY. And he, he, at that time, I was the CEO. Uh, the work we've done was all about networking, making the network for, so for everyone. So how does somebody show up and pay over a billion dollars for Weiss? What? What was the truth? So look, it, it, there was a little interest in the business and obviously it, around that time frame with mobility, still a big deal, and security, compliance, control, um, it, you know, this business was growing very fast and still does. And with the pandemic, now we realize how important remote computing is, yeah. how important cloud is. Look, in 2005, when I used to have presentations about cloud client computing, people, investors, financial analysts would laugh at me. Um, and, and what is this cloud thing? You know, they you do, used to make fun of us, right. and people realize this These is the place dumb to go. Dumb terminals. It, it, they, they called us, you know, dumb terminals. Oh, this is the IBM 5250s. I don't know what that meant. Look, uh, we were building something brand new, and again, going back, part of it was IP differentiation, both hardware, software. Part of it is customer partner experience, and part of it is the old school running the ball one yard at a time. 100% focus on financial discipline and operational excellence. And obviously the team, the people who are gonna make this happen. So that, those, all those pieces came at the same time, at the right time, and a lot of focus on detail. We had an amazing team. Look, from go to market, to support, to service, pre-sales, post-sales, amazing product management, but that's one area that's hugely important in tech. Uh, most of these companies sometimes fail because they don't pay attention to product management. Product managers, run a business. Not the CEO, not the CFO, product managers do run a business. And I paid huge attention to product management. I'm a product management at heart uh, a person myself uh, from my early college years. And I focused on engineering management, industrial understanding, industrial management and product management at a big time. We had the best product managers and those product managers today are CEOs in different companies. So that's a key thing that I see. And I know IGEL does the same thing. You've yeah. done an amazing job with your product management team. And engineering, of course, but great engineers cannot achieve great goals unless the right product management is established. Great sales teams cannot achieve great sales goals unless product management yeah, is well, established. I think the heart so, of any tech company is innovation, right? Exactly. It starts exactly. With product management. Exactly. One of the core values of Agile is innovation. And I think it's really the heartbeat of any good software tech company. You got to be innovating, and that starts with product management, Absolutely. listening to customers, listening to partners, trying to figure out how are you going to sort of do something that no one else is doing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've obviously done a lot of things that were great. Can you, uh, this will probably be the hardest question to answer. Sure, sure. Share with the audience something that didn't work. I mean, you've had a Cinderella career, so share yeah. with us something that uh, you learned from that didn't go right. as planned. So look, for every success, there are tons of failures too. Oh. Um, you know, I'll tell you, um, we got into advice time uh, with a new technology to stream applications without protocols, without Citrix, without VMware, without all the other protocols like RDP from Microsoft at that time. That was a colossal failure. The technology was amazing. We got really excited. We basically put tons of money into this thing. Um, back in 2005, 2007 timeframe, then 2008, economic downturn started, as you remember. With yeah, the, I think you remember you selling me on this product. What was the name of it? Uh, Vice Streaming Manager. But it streaming was a, manager. there was some OEM we put, put into the, we really believed in the product. And it was a colossal failure. It didn't work. It just also created tons of issues with our channel. But we learned from the mistake and we moved very fast and we didn't repeat that mistake again. But again, look, Jen, as you know, if you're making right decisions 70, 80% of the time, you're in great shape. And on the remaining 20, 30%, on those colossal failures, if you can learn from that, that's, in my opinion, nirvana. That's the right. ultimate success. Um, I'll tell you one area, uh, maybe a quick anecdote. Um, 2006 timeframe iPhone comes out, and we tried to build the first virtual app for it, for, uh, uh, for uh, Steve Jobs and the team. It was a complete failure, because our people are server people, they understand protocol, they understand RDP, they understand Citrix, they didn't understand these mobile phones. They didn't know what iOS is. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. I was in Palo Alto at, 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 at the uh, Starbucks. I'm walking and I see these four kids, you know, literally, you know, earrings, you know, bad shirts and, you know, <laughs> greasy hair, old coffee cups doing like coding. And I can see on their Apple, you know, MacBooks, 
an iPhone image that could in some iPhone app. And we were completely failing building in the first app. We literally built the first app for iPhone. I saw these kids, went to them and bought them a couple of co- you know, cups of coffee and banana breads, uh, you know, muffins, you know, uh, which is famous in Starbucks. Convinced them, basically investing in their startup, it was a dating app they're working on. Uh, and they, that dating app eventually became Tinder. And those four kids built our first mobile app called Pocket Cloud. And that was the first mobile app, virtual app on iPhone version one that you can actually connect to your Excel spreadsheet at home or in the office through a wise receiver. That yeah. was the first wise receiver, which led to become the Citrix receiver with Mark and the Citrix team. Wow. So, that and that story. team, that team was not our team. That were like four kids in Palo Alto working on their dating app, they didn't care. But we did an investment right at that Starbucks, getting them into the you know mix. I made one of these kids the product manager. The other three kids built the app for us in less than two months while we were investing their you know, dating app. Yeah, so, I hope you put some money into the Tinder app. And, <laughs> well, that was a good exit for everyone. But the bottom line, what I'm trying to tell you is like, you fail, you learn, and you find different ways to build apps and systems. And they're always upside uh, with this kind of a enrichment of you know, quality of people and projects. You know, whenever you fail, you can turn that into a yeah. success if you, you bring the right people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and fail fast. Exactly. So the one thing that I think you get the most excited about is marketing. And yeah, you know, we're both CEOs, uh, but we were former C- CMOs. So obviously the world's changed a lot. And I know you were famous for a lot of marketing things that you did. I remember uh, your events after VMworld on Thursdays were some of the highlights of any marketing event I ever went to, I think. You had famous people like Michael Dell and Hillary Clinton even once. But uh, I'd love to get your philosophy on marketing because certainly marketing right now is sort of one of the hardest jobs in the world, right? As right. you kind of move to a very digital uh, driven you know, age and it's, you know, people are working at home, they don't answer their phones, they block every email. Right. So talk to, I mean, you're a marketing genius as far as I'm concerned and I've always looked up to you for what you've done with marketing, but no. you know, any advice out there for the aspiring CMO? Sure, no, 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 thank you, thank you, you and I talk about this thing all the time. Uh, look, uh, in my view, uh, best companies uh, have a multifunctional, multi-dimensional approach to everything they do. Engineering, product management, support service, but sales and marketing obviously brings all these things together at the end of the day. Um, I truly believe and enjoy um, telling a story. And that story might be verbal like we're doing right now, but also through the uh, uh, brand equity of a company. Um, I believe every employee is a, has a brand equity and the company as a whole is the combination of this, you know, overall brand equity. So having said all this, um, what can we do differently? What can we do creatively to tell that story? And uh, who can help us do that? So from that perspective, I, I always try to involve the right people with great creative ideas. I had some ideas too, but to be honest with you, a lot of ideas came from different people, from customers, from partners, friends like you. You were uh, uh, doing channel work for MTM. I remember that you had some ideas that you shared with me, we applied some of those things. We constantly listened and learned. And we tied that to a what I call a value network. A lot of VIPs, we worked with Michael Dell. At that time, we, uh, we were doing tons of work with HP, uh, um, um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, with, with Lenovo, with their executive teams. A lot of work going on with Microsoft at that time, with Steve Ballmer and the team. Um, back, obviously, I'm talking about 10, 15 years back. All the resellers are sales teams. So we built a valued network and we let them tell the story on behalf of us. So we tried to create big events because we believed people then get they, you know, together, they share information more effectively. Right. And last point, we built, believed in communities. And as you know, uh, um, I have also a fund uh, called Open Source uh, uh, Capital, SS Capital, with another uh, GP friend, another partner. Uh, we do a lot of open source investments, seed investment, and so forth. And one thing we also tell our you know, uh, portfolio CEOs to differentiate themselves from the rest of the market, rest of the segments. You know, what is different about you? What is your story? And what's the benefit? And what's that message for, and for whom and why? So, and we build you know, communities around them. And I think open source community is a great example how to tell the story. I mean, look at the, some of these amazing companies, you yourself, with your Linux vision, what you're doing with Agile, how you're differentiating against others in the marketplace, which is super exciting to me. 
is incredible. And that obviously follows through with all the great CMOs, CEO actions, and teams. And we're trying to tie that community all together around the right product, right operational strategy, right customer partner experience. Yeah, well, I love all the stuff you, uh, you talk about with ecosystems, community, listening, and uh, the channel. I mean, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about yeah. how the, it sounds like the channel, uh, just like iGel, we're a two-tier, never sold anything direct in 20 years. And uh, I'm sure at Nutanix and Nixenta, these are companies where you, you grew these companies to an extraordinary size through the channel. Talk a little bit about your philosophy of, uh, of the ch actual channel, because obviously the channel's changing right now, right? You have these Big marketplaces and you have managed services. And um, I mean, obviously I, I, I spent 20 years in the channel and some of the best entrepreneurs I know are in the channel because they have to pivot to these new consumption models. So. Yo, talk a little bit about where you think the channel's going in the future and what does the, you know, right. the VAR of the future look like? Right. Look, I'll tell you, there's a huge misconception and myth. Channel is dead. Everybody says, no, channel no. is never going to be dead because we cannot do this alone as vendors. And right. look, we need to reach more people. We need to build a community. And, and the key differentiation, I think, to succeed in channel is to be authentic. You know, a lot of CEOs, you and I know well, they talk the channel talk, but they don't walk the walk, right? They talk about it because they use channel, hey, when I need them, I need them. When I don't need them, I don't need them. Right. Attitude. F to me, at least my experience and my teams and the teams that I work with, we always believe in channel. And two, two tier distribution is the format I like because it gives you know, control to the vendor. It gives control to the channel to do the right things between resellers and distributors. It's also nice to never have any bad debt. 100%, 100%. Let's manage the risk together, yeah. and also let's manage the output and, and revenue together and share it, share the love. Yeah. So I truly believe the partnership with channel in an authentic way. Um, we invest constantly. We invest in channel uh, you know, in a thoughtful way. Uh, we've done that in the past in my other companies with Sterling, with Computer Associates, with IBM, uh, uh, with Quest Software. Uh, we've done the same thing with Wise. We've done the same thing with Nexenta. We've done the same thing with Nutanix. And in, in my you know, um, investment funds, 40 companies being invested with my partner, we believe in channel. And these are all open source community companies. Guess what? Open source is channel itself. Right. The entire community is your channel. The ultimate channel. The ultimate channel. And I'll tell you, I love this. And I know you, you feel the same way. And those companies who fail, I see leadership usually don't understand the channel. And when leadership doesn't understand a channel, and that's a big, big, big failure, and that just trickles down in the organization. Right. In every company I went to uh, uh, with the team, try to hire and nurture the culture that we can win together. We can share the love together. We can share the revenue. We can share the margin. Just this morning, I was uh, talking with one of the biggest channel vendors uh, this morning uh, uh, for breakfast, and we were discussing this. And he was telling me, look, most vendors don't get this. And this is the reason I love working with some of our companies. So right. I cannot stress how big this is, and, and, and there is no school for this. To be honest with you, I talked to Harvard when I was doing my AMP there. There should have some class around this. How to build channel, like executives who understand how to build a channel and manage a channel, critically important. Yeah, I mean, there's no faster way to scale a company than have thousands of people representing it. 100%. I mean, you can't, you can't do it any other way. I remember uh, you invited me to one of your events at MTM in Ohio. I think it was in Columbus or oh, yeah. it's in Cleveland. I'm trying to remember. Cleveland. That was, was when I was at MCPC. Yeah. That's probably 2005, 2006. Yes. You were on stage. Steve was on the street at that time, your CEO. And look, I came to this channel meeting. You have about 100 of your employees there and managers. That one day I learned more about channel than anywhere else I could. And imagine the experiences we built around that, learning from each other over the past 20 years. So, yeah. so look, this is priceless, priceless uh, knowledge and, and energy creation through you know, partners and win. Totally. Well, uh, I want to switch gears and we'll probably talk about a topic that everybody's sick of talking about, but it feels like COVID is coming to an end, right? It feels, I, I don't know, you came into the city today, it's a little more alive, we're not wearing right. masks anymore, and uh, we're starting to feel like we're uh, getting back to a sense of normalcy. I know it's a topic that's kind of near and dear to you. You have a, two beautiful children and your wife is a doctor at Stanford. And yeah, I'd just love to get your thoughts on how the world has changed right. through uh, COVID and kind of how you see us emerging coming out of COVID. How, sure. how do you see that? Look, uh, first, personal experience, you know this. I got actual COVID uh, last year, late last year in December. I was hospitalized for a couple of weeks. It was very tough for me. 
Um, I was and very, you're vaccinated too, And right? I was double vaccinated. My booster was scheduled a bit later in the month, and I got this before. We were very careful. My wife is in oncology. She deals with, you know, cancer patients, stage four, stage five. We have two-year-old and a six-year-old, and we were very careful with masks and so on, and I still got it. Uh, um, and obviously, it was a very difficult time for me. I just saw the impact. This is real, um, and it's, it's very difficult, we, you know. Thousands of people, now millions of people, you know, uh, lost their lives. And as you know, they uh, uh, they got impacted by this. And the entire world is going through this t tremendous economic downturn. But at the same time, like anything negative, there's always an opportunity and upside. And the upside in this one, uh, even though it's unique, and as a, as, a, as a survivor of COVID, I'll tell you, um, I saw the patient care at Stanford Hospital. And I realized watching all those, you know, zero clients, cloud clients, some of your IGEL devices, some of my previous devices, the software, you know, all these identity cards and security, the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, nurses, yes. you know, for the proximity cards, some of them in Provada, ping identity there. You know, all our vendor ecosystem is like in this place. And I'm like, I'm proud of our ecosystem, our industry, how we help, you know, healthcare and patient care. And now beyond that, with remote computing, cloud client computing, I think it's going to be even bigger. I'm seeing tremendous opportunities here, not only for healthcare industry, for finance, banking finance. I'm an investor through our fund into a company which is uh, delivering open source based Bloomberg devices to zero client devices. Bloomberg capabilities to a zero client device, zero device, a cloud device with all the data extraction and analysis you know, capabilities and assets built into an all open source community. Opportunities are huge in this. And I think as we move forward in this hybrid world, in the office, off office, at home, on the go, with mobility, the security is going to be a big deal. I think this is the rebirth of desktop uh, virtualization, desktop as a service, and user as a service, so to speak. So I think the future is bright, and I think pandemic showed the people this technology, the things that we're talking about from a security control perspective is going to be there for a long time. Absolutely. So I'd love to talk to you a little bit about Nutanix. I know you've been there for almost three years now and you've played a big role in kind of some of the transition that's happened there. And it feels like a parallel to iGel, right? Like a hardware company that transitioned to software that's uh, now transitioning to cloud and subscription. And that's certainly the path that iGel has, has been on also. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's clearly sure. not an easy transition, right? It's sure. tough. And in the case of Nutanix, doing it in the light of the public market is even harder. So no, absolutely. God bless you for uh, you know, being part of that. So look, uh, the ecosystem is, uh, I think, uh, 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 very vibrant, right? Um, there are a couple of things here. You know, you have the you know, cloud platform companies like VMware, like Red Hat, like Nutanix, and then the, this open stack, so to speak, open source community touching this space from different angles, right? You know, with SUSE, with Rancher acquisition, and, you know, in the play, obviously, they're doing a lot of great work. I, the way I view also tying to this, you know, what's Azure, GCP, you know, Google Cloud, with OCI Oracle Cloud, IBM Cloud, obviously, with the work they're doing after their few acquisitions in the cloud space, and obviously, AWS itself. The entire ecosystem is super dynamic, and I think EUC as a service and user company as a service now on-prem and off-prem and hybrid is a big story. So my view is, you know, in the industry, there is a new energy with the pandemic, as I mentioned earlier, with this remote competent, you know, um, um, opportunity around secure, controlled cloud client computing. I think you're going to see more integration between these companies. Like, look, VMware is very close with AWS. Nutanix is doing a lot of work with Azure. Um, and OCI and IBM Cloud and GCP. Google Cloud today is OEM and Frame, that's about a service. Uh, um, you know, um, as you know, AWS did a lot of work with PCORIP with Teradici. Teradici is now part of HP uh, yeah. Incorporated. It's an incredibly uh, intertwined ecosystem. And I think as IGEL, you guys have a huge opportunity because you are the pure play independent company and you have the birthright to partner with everyone right. because you are independent, you're the Switzerland, you have opportunities with AWS, with Azure, uh, with OCI, with IBM Cloud, you have opportunities with VMware, Nutanix, Red Hat, you have opportunities with Dell, HP, and, 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 and Lenovo. So I see your position as a, a very uh, unique and opportunist position and for customers as well because they see if I deployed IGEL, I can play with all these vendors, and exactly. I give I give choice to my end users. So from that perspective, I see this, you know, era 
the era of openness. And also now tying to this is all the open source activity, open source community comes into this, with different applications, you know, for the entire stack, creates tons of opportunities for the ecosystem and for you, for yeah. Idol, of course. Yeah, uh, you're hired, I, I love that <laughs> answer. <laughs> so uh, one thing that probably has changed dramatically since you know, uh, your days at Weiss was Microsoft, right? So Microsoft always was sort of tacitly involved with uh, delivering you know, Windows desktops and applications, right? They were collecting a nice uh, tax on it, but they weren't really endorsing it. And I think, you know, we're going to have Scott Manchester on the next attic actually and talk to him about, you know, sort of birthing Azure Virtual Desktop. And now he's gone on to, to build Windows 365, right? Native uh, Windows, you know, delivered uh, virtual desktop, right? And so, you know, the, this to us is like also kind of game changing, right? In terms of the, the actual originator of the Windows code really endorsing it. And of course, millions of people have taken advantage of that as it came to market through the pandemic. So love to get your thoughts on how, you know, the 800 pound gorilla is now right. really uh, actually endorsing it, it, with full, full throated endorsement of this right. architecture. So how right. do you see that? Look, I'm, I'll be open. Uh, you know, you know my style. I just don't be there on the bush. Look, I, I, I love Amazon, Jeff, Andy, the team, Matt Garman, We've done tons of work with them in the past. Some of my portfolio companies are doing a lot of work with Amazon. Uh, Next Center did a lot of work. Nutanix is doing a lot of work. Uh, some of you know open source portfolio that we manage is just all in this. And OCI has great plans. Oracle Cloud was the first bare metal cloud, by the way. Uh, give them the credit. They saw that first. Um, obviously, IBM Cloud doing tons of work around financial services. Project Hamilton, you know the how the financial services transactions are happening through. 10,000 plus banks with 20 US banks are leading this effort, you know, with the government. So all this great stuff. GCP is getting into this. GCP is a little more developer oriented with their, you know, Kubernetes, you know, uh, solution. But among all of them, Microsoft, in my view, has the birthright to win in this because they own the Windows platform. Right. At the end of the day, they control the operating system. And I believe, you know, uh, Chris Young, as you know, Chris can, comes from original Cisco, VMware, you know, McAfee, Intel, he gets the endpoints, he gets the end user, end-to-end -end integration from back end to front end. He understands the thin clients, he understands the desktop as a service. Now he's running all the corp dev there. Satya, as you know, like he comes from the space. He was the OG. He was the original one. I remember in 2004, 2005, I used to talk to Satya all the time. On a monthly basis, our revenue numbers are on Windows embedded for right. our thin devices, fatter thin devices with Windows because of the drivers we had in that. And he, he knows the space in and out. He understands thermal services and cloud. And obviously you have an amazing team there with Scott Guthrie, with Eric Lockhart, you know, the entire team is incredible. So I truly believe Azure and Microsoft is gonna have huge upper hand in this on the desktop side of things because they understand their value. And the key thing I love about Microsoft, they care about partners. They understand yeah. the customer partner experience. We get a lot of good work uh, with our portfolio companies. And, you know, Nutanix has done a lot of great work on this. I know you're doing tons of work, and I yeah, know the fact- it's a very strange thing for a, a Linux operating system to be partnering very closely. We have people up there every week, practically, in their development. I mean, so you, to your point, they do know how to partner. They do understand the value 100%. of the ecosystem. Look, GitHub acquisition, right? GitHub yes. is the one of the biggest, you know, that's an open source platform per se, and get another OG, right? So, you know, Satya made the clear distinction Yes, we, we own the Windows, we love Windows, but look, there's a huge developer community. Open source is real. That's why I have a big focus on open source investments and with my portfolio as well there, and tying that to the things we're doing uh, around the world with, you know, um, obviously some of the activity we're doing with Nutanix and others. So making sure that we deliver an end-to-end -end user experience between both Windows environments and non-Windows open source environments from DevOps to DevSecOps to AI to security as a whole beyond DevSecOps itself and all the infrastructure behind that from data center to the end user computing to the edge all coming together in a hybrid cloud fashion both on the private cloud and public cloud and obviously mostly in a hybrid cloud fashion because most of our companies are going to go both ways. Some workloads are going to be in public, some workloads are going to be private and I believe Microsoft and Azure has a really clear idea how this is going to play out because they are also on the Windows platform. So I believe Microsoft is the right partner for many of these workloads for companies like Agile. 
Yeah, well, I think the word you said is hybrid and security, right? It's, it's a hybrid cloud world. It's in the humans are in a hybrid, 100%. right? We're going to be moving around. So in closing, you know, I just want to say thank you because you've been a, uh, a great mentor and friend to me. I think we met almost every month, even before I took the job at IGEL, I came and consulted with you and uh, you've been like a big brother to me. And uh, I guess I'll ask you, in front, front of everybody, you know, how do you think uh, IGEL is doing? I mean, you kind of alluded to it, but um, yeah, we we've been on this path, and uh, you know, we're tr we're trying to kind of recreate, uh, you know, how this technology is consumed. We've really pivoted into a pure software company, and in fact, a lot of what we do is actually, you know, go and uh, resurface a lot of the great hardware that you installed, actually, right? Um, so as my uh, mentor and big brother, you know, thank you for the for all the advice, and I learn some something from you every time we sit down together. But yeah, I just love, curious in terms of you know your thoughts on our trajectory and any advice you have to me and our 400 employees at, sure. at Agile who will certainly tune into this. Look, I'll tell you, Jed, you've been an amazing friend, partner to me, and you're mentor to me too. I, I learned a lot from you and things that you're working on and the team. I'll tell you. Um, when I met Agile team, Eagle team in Germany, this is like almost now 15 years ago, they were building an amazing device and they had a great management software and they really figured out open source and Linux, how they built that technology. And I was very impressed. But on the software front, they still were struggling with how software behaves, how software is monetized and, and how support and service delivered as a software company. And I think you and the team, done a phenomenal job to transform in the company from that amazing foundation Heiko and the team did and, and the original investors now created this amazing powerhouse as what Agile is today, as a software powerhouse. And I'll tell you, the feedback I'm getting from customers, enterprises, both in you know public sector and private sector is super positive. You and I talked about a couple of opportunities and I think understanding the open source community, the Linux and the way you partner with big cloud partners like Azure, and also the other platform vendors that you're doing a lot of work with Dells and HPEs and the Nose of the world. It's incredible and more power to you. And I think you know channel better than anybody else I know in this business and you build an amazing team. You know, there is no hurdle I see for Agile. And I like your attitude, guys. You know, and always I feel about the team at Agile is look, we're gonna always, you know, uh, find a way. If you cannot find a way, we're gonna build a way, right? right. So that that attitude is important for customers. And I'll, uh, most people don't know this, but I'm gonna share. The other day, I was texting you. I asked you, hey, can you go stop by this customer because I think they have an interest for Agile. And you sent me a text in front of the door of that customer in Florida and say, I'm he actually here. <laughs> and I love that power of now energy that you have and you instilled in the company as the culture. I don't see anything you know, slowing you guys down. Yeah. I'm a big fan. I tell uh, I tell all my employees that uh, there's one thing that I love, and that is having a, a bias for action, right? right. It's like, 100%. why put off what you could do right this minute? Uh, let's get it done. 100%. So in closing, you know, you're probably one of the most beloved figures in end user commute, compute, right? You have uh, just an electrifying personality, and we always let uh, you know, our guests sort of get the last word in. There's a lot of people in the... I mean, I know you remember the synergies and the VM worlds, and we now have this disrupt roadshow that we do around the world that's taken on a, a life of its own. We have a big uh, Slack community where this will be watched with 10,000 people on it. So is there anything you want to share to all those beautiful end user compute? It's a small world, right? It's this somewhat uh, special, special family that we uh, live in, and I'm sure, you know, they're going to be delighted to hear from you and see you and see that you're doing so well. But if there's anything you'd like to say to them, like, look, the only get the thing last I was, word. The only, a little bit of historical anecdote. You know, uh, until, uh, you know, uh, in, in Middle Ages, in, in Mediterranean, in Europe, uh, the sailors thought um, when they hit the Gibraltar uh, at the end of the Mediterranean, the world would just end and you would fall down. They right. thought the world was flat. And explorers, you know, the Spanish, Portuguese, and other, you know, European explorers first figure out, actually, you can go through the Mediterranean and there is a thing called an ocean, and maybe there are lands beyond that. Until 1492, you know, we did not know that Americas existed and many other places existed. So I see our community are as those explorers. And in this Spanish flag, there are two columns. It says plus ultra, further beyond. 
that's my motto. I think this is the beginning. I really don't believe EUC and user computing is at its end. Actually, this is a new beginning. Pandemic showed us that you need to be careful about security, control, and remote life. And our lives are remote ever, you know, more than ever. I mean, look at this at, at home, at, you know, at, you know, on the go in the office. Now we're going to be even more remote and more hybrid than ever before. So having said all this, I think EUC and EUC as a service in a hybrid world is going to be a bigger, bigger opportunity. Plus ultra. Plus ultra. Yeah. Well, we love you, Tarkin. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we'll have you back again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. Wow. That was an exciting discussion. I woke up this morning and I was super pumped to talk to Tarkin. And of course, he, he never fails to deliver wisdom. I hope uh, uh, you got a lot out of it. I certainly did. Thank you so much for stopping by The Attic and being a subscriber to our YouTube channel. We're very excited about our next guest, Scott Manchester. He's a 20-year veteran of Microsoft. He's the godfather of the Azure Virtual Desktop product. And he's now breaking new ground with Windows 365. As always, lots of interesting perspectives on leadership and values and the future of tech and EUC coming your way on The Attic. So please make sure you subscribe to the iGel YouTube channel and you'll get all the alerts of when these episodes drop. And so until we meet again, this is Jed Ayers from iGel wishing you a great day. Be kind to each other and be well.